a very warm welcome to this um, BEREC workshop on software-defined networks and network function virtualization. Um, you may be aware of the fact that BEREC um, has been asked questions by the Commission on the implications of these developments and therefore we are trying to learn today. I'm very happy to announce Joran Mavi, the Director General of PTS, who used to be um, Barrack Chair in 2014 and has more than 20 years of experience in the IT sector, so we think he is the perfect Barrack board member to open this workshop. Joran, the floor is yours. Thank you. <coughs> what a statement. The perfect board member. I'm actually not on the board anymore, so that's maybe why I'm perfect. <laughs> Good morning to you all. Um, I, when I was preparing the speech, I realized something as a regulator, that regulating was much easier a couple of years ago. I mean, it, think about it, in a world of circuit switched, uh, no IP, um, no ISPs, no internet, no IP packaging, just traveling through routers with no quality of service, life got to be more easy. And that is one of the reasons why we're standing here today. Because looking at it, <coughs> this separation between the infrastructure layer and the transport layer has some disadvantages for us regulators. Oh, the role of a regulator, what is the purpose of regulation? We had a very nice dinner, by the way, yesterday, uh, some of our colleagues uh, in going up to this conference. And we actually start talking, what is it? Why do we do what we do? There is a very simple reason for what we do. We are here to protect the consumers. That's the only purpose we do in regulation. We are not there to preserve investment. We are not there to preserve anything else than just to, to stand between something or someone and the consumers. In the circuit switch world, with old monopolies, that was a very clear task. Because you know who the potential monopolists were, and you knew most of the time who the consumers were and you also knew your government. With, with this new technology, the bottlenecks that creates monopolistic behavior could now exist in many different places. And it's not that easy to understand where we are going to or not going to regulate. Because there is more than one problem to be solved and there is also one, more than one way to actually solve the problem. In European regulation, we talk a lot about potential bottlenecks. And you all know it, but I always repeat it, is that we work with a tool called ex ante. With a difference on, on competition law, what we're trying to do is to look into the future. And we try to say, we don't like that future, we would like to change that potential future future by doing something today. That is really ex ante, to look into the future and change it. So we do spend a lot of time looking into things like this to understand what the technology is doing us, which is a difference from, from competition law when you actually could say that you, you're a crook and I'm going to do something with you now because you've done something wrong. But it also gives us a, a, a mandate which is very strong because we cannot be wrong. And going down to what we're trying to achieve with sessions like this is that we're trying to understand the technology that is happening, that is going to happen, so we can take that into account when we look into future regulation or things that we actually impose today. I, uh, between us, um, it's very fun to be a regulator, but I have to admit, sometimes a little bit scary as well, because some of the decisions we are making today will have a large impact going forward you don't look like you actually agree with me, but it is that, scary sometimes. I mean, if you look, I'm, I worked in the IT industry for since the beginning of the 90s. Uh, I bought my first internet access back in 93 or 94. It costed about 20,000 euros, and it didn't work. Um, I think the speed we had was 9.6. Do you, anyone old enough to remember that? And we had a 19, oh? 19.2, do you remember that as well? Yeah, modems, yeah. All you under 40 don't have to, you know. But the technology change we are seeing with all the new way of, of, of 
the, the inter the, when the internet was built, it was not built for quality. It was built for access, not even speed, and not even security. And over the last couple of years, a lot of new technologies has been coming around to address that thing. When we had a dinner yesterday, we talked about things like ATM and frame relay as a quality enabler. And now we talk about stuff like MPLS, or you're going to talk about today. The balance we as a regulator does is that we look on the consumer on one end and the providers on the other end. There are things that comes around right now that could be very, very important for the end consumers. Better healthcare services, traffic management, electrical grids, um, 112 services. There's a lot of things that need special attention in an IP routed network, which IP wasn't designed for in the first place. That is one way, and you can solve that in the infrastructure or on the IP level. On the other hand, we have to understand and figure out if those technologies also create new bottlenecks for the end users or giving the ability for anyone to produce new monopolies which take away the customer choice. And customer choice is very important for it. This is the task that now Barrick has been asked by the Commission, but it's also a very something that you will see more and more coming out of Barrick. That we have sessions like this and we try really to understand and really trying to understand what the technology is driving us. And that's very new for us regulators. It was easier for us early days that we had a law book, we knew something about the customers, we knew the infrastructure, and we can impose uh, legislation on them. Now, more and more, we really need to understand. And the only reason we do that is to make sure that we always create the choice the customer needs. I wish you a good day. I wish I would have been here longer. Uh, but I think I'm going gonna, gonna to read out what, what you got from this with great interest. Thank you very much. Joran, thanks very much for uh, coming to open the workshop. And now you're busy, I know. <laughs> um, let me hand over to my coach, uh, Wilhelm Schramm, who is a senior expert at uh, RTR has been with the Austrian Academy of Sciences for many years, and he's now setting out the perspectives that we have and the questions we have um, on our topic so that we hopefully will have a focused discussion um, today. Oh, okay, it's coming. Uh, welcome to everybody. Uh, one might ask, why do we discuss software-defined networking and network functions virtualization today? And I would assume that all of you know that software-defined networking, SDN, and network functions virtualizations, NFV, are two new fundamental technology developments on which the electronic communication sector, together with the IT sector, worked very intensely over the last years. SDN and NFV have the potential to completely change how networks are built and operated today. Therefore, from a regulatory perspective, it is of interest and to anticipate which regulatory impact SDN and NFV will have. Today, experts in the area of SDN and NFV will present their views on the regulatory implications of SDN and NFV. The results of the workshop will help Barrick to form its opinion on the regulatory framework with regard to and the review of the regulatory framework with regard to SDN and NFV. <laughs> SDN is a new technological development, and one may ask what is new? What is SDN? According to the Open Networking Foundation, which was launched in 2011 by Deutsche Telekom, Google, Microsoft, Facebook, Verizon, and Yahoo, the Open Networking Foundation is taking the lead in SDN standardization. The ONF, the Open Networking Foundation, defined an SDN architecture, and according to this definition, the SDN architecture consists of three layers. On the bottom, the infrastructure layer. This layer consists of the network devices and elements which provide switching and forwarding of the packets through the network. On top of the infrastructure layer, 
is the application layer. Uh, the uh, control layer, excuse me. In the control layer resides the control functionality which supervises the network forwarding behavior of the underlying network and infrastructure layer through the so-called southbound application programming interface. Another term used is resource control interface, for example, by the ITUT. On top is the application layer. The application layer consists of the applications which consumes the SDN communication services through the so-called northbound application programming interface. Another term used is application control interface. According to the Open Networking Foundation, SDN has three key attributes. One key attribute is that the control functionality in the control layer is logically centralized and therefore has the view of the whole underlying network and infrastructure layer, which enables to make much more optimized forwarding decisions. This is not the case in networks today, where each network node autonomously make forwarding decision based on the local view of the network. Another key attribute is programmability. The control functionality in the control layer is inherently built on software and therefore the control functionality is programmable. The third key attribute is abstraction. The underlying layer is abstracted and the layer on top of it does not need all the details of the underlying layer. NFV is a new technological development and one might again ask what is new, what is NFV? The network operators of the ETSI NFV industry specification group, which was formed in late 2012 by over 20 of the world's largest telecommunication service providers, describe NFV as follows. NFV aims to transform how networks are built and operated today. The IT virtualization technology, which is already used very successfully in the area of cloud services, will be developed further in order to enable this and to move what is shown here on the slide on the left side to the right side. The left side of this figure show the shows the situation in the networks of today. A variety of purpose-built hardware appliances is used, for example, a provider edge router, BRAS, SGSN, GGSN, session border controller, deep packet inspection, and so on. In networks based on NFV, this variety of hard purpose-built hardware appliances is no longer misused, and instead, only three types of hardware resources are used industry standard server, storage, and Ethernet switches, and the network functions are implemented in software. The ETSI NFV industry specification group already <coughs> has defined a NFV high-level framework. According to this definition, the NFV high-level framework consists of three domains. On the bottom, the NFV infrastructure domain. This domain consists of the hardware resources, the industry standard server for computing, industry standard storage, and industry standard Ethernet switches for networking. On top of the hardware resources within the NFV infrastructure domain is the, an abstraction layer. The abstraction layer abstracts the underlying hardware resources and makes them uh, accessible by software. On top is a virtualized network function domain. A virtualized network function is the virtualization and software implementation of a network function. This is not the case in the networks of today, in which the network functions are implemented based on a variety of purpose-built hardware appliances shown on the slide before. A virtualized network function has the possibility to use the hardware resources through the abstraction layer of the NFV infrastructure domain. Both domains, the virtual network function domain and the NFV infrastructure domain, are managed and orchestrated by a third domain, the NFV management and orchestration domain. 
SDN and NAV are two different technological developments and one may ask, what is the relation between SDN and NFV? According to the network operators of the AC NFV Infra Industry Specification Group, the relation is as follows. NFV is highly complementary to SDN. And ultimately, SDN and NFV may be subsumed in one software defined network paradigm. Therefore, network operators does not need to decide to deploy either SDN or NFV, but instead have the possibility to use both and to combine SDN and NFV appropriately. SDN and NFV is still in a stage of dynamic developments, and this is also the case for how to combine SDN and NFV. The Etsy NFV Industry Specification Group recently finished a report on the use of SDN in networks based on, NF on NFV. One may ask, how will a future network based on SDN and NFV probably look like? This question is answered in this figure based on the view of Arthur De Little and Bell Labs. A future network based on SDN and NFV may consist of a streamlined IP optical network and an optimized wireline and or wireless access. Virtualized network functions are implemented in larger network data centers in the core of the network. For example, virtual home subscriber service, virtual uh, DNS or virtualized AAA or a virtual IMS. These virtualized network functions relate to signaling traffic. Virtual network functions which relate to performance may also be implemented at the edge of the network. As for example, virtualized CPE, uh, virtualized evolved packet core, virtualized broadband network gateway, or virtualized deep packet inspection, or a virtualized baseband unit, or a virtualized customer premises equipment. These network functions are related to the user plane traffic. Connectivity between locations, for example, between the core and the edge, is provided based on SDN-based VPNs. In the network, also extended network functions may be implemented as virtualized content net data networks or virtualized intrusion detection and prevention systems, network as a service, platform as a service, and infrastructure as a service. SDN and NFV are developed, and one may ask why, what are the benefits of SDN and NFV? The network operators of the ATC NFV Industry Specification Group and the Open Networking Foundation describe the benefits of SDN and NFV as follows. Networks based on NS SDN and NFV have a completely new dimension of programmability, automation and network control. Reduced network equipment costs and reduced operational costs. Rapid innovation is enabled and reduced time to market. Targeted service introduction depending on geography or consumer sets. Op optimizing of network configuration and or topology in uh, near real time. Much more efficient test and integration and several further benefits. From a regulatory perspective, the following questions are of interest. Will SDN and NFV enable new forms of fixed network access, which provides alternative network operators more control over the network of the incumbent compared to current layer two horses access products, also known as virtual and bundling local access or Ethernet bitstream? It seems that this will be the case because in networks based on SDN and NFV, the control functionality is logically centralized. And if third party access is possible to this logically centralized control functionality, then one network operator may have access to the logically centralized control functionality in the network of another operator. And with this, the possibility to use and control the underlying virtualized network infrastructure of the other operator. Another question of interest is, will SDN and NFV enable new forms of interconnection of networks for data or Ethernet services, 
based on which network operators are able to uh, offer new forms of uh, data or Ethernet services to their customers, which enable the customers to dynamically set up on demand data or Ethernet connections, similarly to for phone calls. If this will be actually possible, then network operators, which terminates data or Ethernet connections, may have a natural monopoly similar to network operators which terminates phone calls. Therefore, in order to prevent the uh, an misuse of market power, it may be necessary to regulate the termination rates of data or Ethernet connections. A further question of interest is, will SDN and NFV enable other new forms of network access and network sharing? From an economic perspective, a question of interest is, will SDN and NFV have an impact on the current value chain? If this is the case, on which stage and which impact? Will SDN and NFV also have an impact on the boundaries between netco network operators? A topic discussed rather intensely within the electronic communication sector is the relation between OTT over the top providers and telecommunication service providers. Therefore, a question of interest is, will SDN and NFV have an impact on this relation? Will OTT providers benefit more from SDN and NFV compared to telecommunication service providers, or will it be the other way around? And there is a further question of interest, will SDN and NFV have further regulatory implications? Now, experts in the area of SDN and NFV will present their view on the regulatory implications of SDN and NFV. There will, blah, there will pre be presentations from three standard development organizations, from the Open Networking Foundation, the ETSI NFV Industry Specification Group, and the MEF, presentations from three network operators, called QSC and Telefonica, and presentations of three vendors, Nokia, which recently took over Arca de Lucent, Fujitsu, and Hewlett Packard. The workshop will end with a panel discussion with all presenters of the workshop. Literature referred to in this presentation is listed in the annex to this presentation. <coughs> Thank you. Are there any immediate questions to this presentation? What we intend to do is have a short Q&A session after each presentation, but we should restrict it to, to comprehensibility and, and, uh, because we will have a time for a discussion, uh, I hope, in the panel discussion. So are there any immediate questions um, with regard to Wilhelm's um, presentation? Doesn't look like it. Okay, um, perhaps let me say one, one more sentence. I hardly dare to speak as an economist who really is in the learning position today. But perhaps just as a year on pointed out, customer choice is, is the ultimate goal of regulation. And obviously, our, we have always believed that c competition is the best way to achieve this. And that's why, obviously, we are really interested to see what the implications are for competition of these new technologies. Um, we are now very happy um, to announce Sandra Scott Hayward, uh, who is an expert and an ONF uh, research associate. Uh, she is uh, affiliated with Queen's University, and I'm really having trouble to read the full, you see. Oh, I don't <laughs> um, read she <laughs> <laughs> She is a senior engineer in the Network Security Research Group at the Center for Secure Information Technologies at Queen's University Belfast, and we are uh, happy to hear your presentation. Thank you very much, um, and thank you for the invitation to participate today. Um, as Cara mentioned, I'm here on behalf of the Open Networking Foundation. Uh, I'm a research associate with the, Open, with the ONF, uh, and also vice chair of the security working group, so my interest uh, really within ONF uh, revolves around security and network security. Um, where I'm coming from, as Cara also mentioned, I'm from Queen's University Belfast, a research engineer there, and specifically attached to the Cybersecurity Institute or the Center for Secure Information Technologies. 
Um, that's an institute that was established about six years ago now, uh, and the idea behind it was along the lines of uh, similar institutes like SRI, Stanford Research Institute, and ETRI in Korea, uh, to combine the <coughs> academic research output that we do. Um, generally, when we're looking for funding now, it has to be very impact-driven and impact-focused. We have to show that we're going to produce something that's relevant to the industry um, out of what we're, what we're researching. So we work um, as engineers with the academics and then with business development to try and bring some of the products, uh, bring some of the research into productization uh, generally within there. So Wilhelm gave a lovely introduction to the Open Networking Foundation. Uh, what I'm doing in the presentation here is to give uh, an intro to ONF and what the current work is being done in the, in the area, uh, and then hopefully try to um, uh, answer some of the questions, the regulatory implication questions that were raised around this. Um, so the ONF I is user-driven. Um, as Wilhelm also mentioned, it was established in 2011 uh, with a group of about five or six members, and now a membership of about 132, uh, including something like, I think, uh, 30 carriers. Um, and the idea behind the ONF is promotion and adoption uh, of SDN. Uh, so that's really revolving around three particular areas. Uh, the first and probably most commonly understood is around OpenFlow, which is the southbound protocol uh, or API uh, for separation of the forwarding and control plane. Um, that's the first SDN standard. Um, so there's work going on in that area. Um, then there's also a set of te technical communities. And again, this is split out across service and market uh, areas, uh, also specification and, and operator. And, and that group of technical communities has also evolved uh, as the work of ONF uh, has evolved and has the adoption of SDN in different deployments uh, has taken place. So this is user driven. Um, so the requirements or the interests of the, of the community membership drives what goes on, what gets discussed here within these groups. And I'll mention a few of the specifics around that next. Uh, and then the second, or the third thing at least, is open source SDN. Uh, and I think this is particularly relevant to the discussion today. So the idea that um, you don't necessarily need to sit down today and have a standardization committee come up with a specification or a standard, um, but a perhaps a more um, progressive way of doing that is to actually build code. Uh, and software, this is obviously easier than in, in, in a hardware from a, a traditional networking perspective. With ASICs and the long evolution time there, you're investing a lot of money. Um, but with open source, we can actually take, some, take an idea, uh, and this is also, again, particularly relevant for the academic perspective, having access to open source tools in terms of research development. Um, you can take an idea, expand on it, iterate it, try to evolve what actually functionality is required there, uh, fix bugs in it, and then bring that to specification discussions and to standardization dis discussions. Um, so hopefully to make a little bit of a faster um, and progress in terms of the actual standards uh, that will be required for the community to implement SDN and NFE. So around some of the specifics, uh, things that have been looked at in the last uh, 12 months or so and are ongoing uh, within the technical community, um, there are two here at the top, the northbound APIs. So I mentioned the open flow, that would be considered the, the southbound API, and there is that standard, it's well adopted. There are obviously other um, southbound APIs uh, in, in, in use, um, but less so, much less so than, than open flow. Uh, the northbound API, there hasn't actually been any standard established. Uh, and as people begin to move up the, up the stack a little bit and to look more at the services um, that you want to provision with this network, um, the application to control our interface and management and orchestration interface, that needs to be uh, reviewed. So two, a sort of direction that's been taken there is looking at intent-based forwarding. So to abstract um, the, the, the requirement for the service. So rather than having a specific, in the traditional sense, you'd have a, 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 almost a siloed approach uh, where you have a specific or protocol required to, to write the application, to communicate to a controller, to feed onto the network in terms of what forwarding you actually want to take place down there. Um, with the intent, you're actually describing uh, a, a desire. So I want all the traffic from um, uh, enterprise A to transmit th to enterprise B, for example. Uh, that gets translated into whatever way uh, the controller underneath, or the control infrastructure underneath, and the de network elements underneath need to uh, implement that. So the idea of, of developing this in, a, in an abstracted form is to have um, uh, an information model, and that's the next one down here, that you can actually 
uh, anybody can rewrite different protocols that will fit to this particular, particular model. So you can use different things, but there will be a standard um, method to talk to the network, for example, across, uh, across the community. Um, so it's probably worth noting here in terms of what I've got in brackets there, the intent-based framework is in open daylight at the moment and flow objects is how it's described in open network operating systems. So although there is a, a path here towards uh, standardizing this and towards agreement uh, about how the approach, you can see already in, in two of these open source projects there is a, there is a difference in how it's done. Um, but we anticipate uh, a move uh, to... to um, come to be better agreement between those over the, over the coming years, and that will have to take place in order to have true uh, implementation of an open SDN uh, architecture. And the second bull on the list there is related to information modeling. Um, and I think that would be agreed in, in, um, across the community that this is the real thing that needs to be uh, to be agreed upon in the in the coming year. Uh, I'm sure many of you are aware that XCNFE had a, had a workshop uh, about last week uh, and they've had a press release out describing that uh, a whole group of STOs including ONF, ETSI-MF, um, etc. Uh, congregated to discuss this common information model uh, and to come to a, a discussion that we will actually work together uh, to try and build common information models and data models as required for provisioning end-to-end -end services, which is particularly relevant for the operators and carriers. Um, so I'm sure you'll hear a little bit more about that later on from, from Etsy NFE. Um, on the layer four to seven work, so OpenFlow itself uh, as, a, as a protocol looked at layers two to layer four um, and one of the differences there in the terms of the description is the granularity of open flow for programming the network. Uh, so you can look at the, the packet, you're not just looking at an, an IP layer, an IP header and a MAC header, but also the VLAN and the MPLS tags, etc. Uh, that can provision a certain amount of the requirements uh, for the services that, that uh, operators want to implement within the network. But obviously there's a lot more going on at higher applications, and particularly from a security perspective, um, looking at the application types that are being driven across the network. So there is work in the layer four to seven um, group looking at potentially um, stateful open flow, um, where you maintain, for example, on your TCP uh, traffic, that you maintain a session information within the, within the actual network element itself, um, and then also to come up with a service function chaining solution. Uh, on the carrier grade side, um, there's been work towards migration methods and techniques. Um, I know this colleague here today will probably talk a bit more about that. There was a face-to-face -face meeting um, of several working groups of ONF last week, um, and they will be publishing a document on carrier grade SDN um, and how to meet the carrier grade and service quality requirements in this architecture. Uh, and then just in terms of a couple of asides really about how this is um, put into practice, and one of them relates there to the open source SDN. Um, open Networking Foundation have had plug fests since the beginning of uh, its establishment in order to enable, so with OpenFlow um, there's a range of specifications, obviously there's different versions of the specification and from a hardware perspective, from a network element perspective, there's different implementations of that. Um, so you may speak OpenFlow but you may speak it slightly differently. Um, so in order to uh, produce a conformance um, uh, certification. They've had plug fests, so where different products are tested against each other uh, to test for conformance. Uh, and then most recently, again, with the, with the open source work, the SDN Solutions Showcase has taken place at the Open Networking Summit uh, and at L123 in Dusseldorf every year, um, where basically some of these ideas for actual service implementation and for proof of concepts have been put into place and are showcased. Um, so this is actually SDN and NFE working. Uh, and then finally, just a quick note on the certification. Obviously, this changes quite a bit. Um, traditionally, you obviously would probably be aware of Cisco and Juniper certifications. Um, there's a lot of different knowledge and understanding required uh, to move into the SDN and NFC space, and ONF are trying to support that with working with uh, training providers and offering these certifications. And the exam questions that are, uh, comprise the certification or the test uh, have actually been developed by all of the, the members of the technical working group, so they're directly relevant to, to the field. I'll just pick out um, two on here on open source SDN to give an example of how this works. Uh, open source SDN is open to the public, so you don't necessarily need to be a member of ONF to contribute. 
Um, and a lot of the projects are deriving out of the technical working groups. So for example, the one that I'm involved in is, is Project Florence, which is a security assessment tool. So from the technical uh, group that we work in, we, we built a test suite, uh, which is like a paper-based specification. What do we think uh, switch uh, security should look like and controller security should look like? Um, and we will move on to applications, but it's a little bit more uh, complex. Um, but basically, we've written a test spec um, and what we want to do here is actually develop a test tool. So one, to verify that we've got a, a legitimate set of tests that actually uh, make sense that they're written correctly, someone could implement them, and also to provide a tool to, uh, to vendors to, to actually test their security of the solution. Um, so it's bringing the two together, and then as we see, if we, when we implement the test tool, that it doesn't make any sense, one of the particular tests, for example, or if it's not correctly specified, we can obviously iterate on that. Uh, another particularly useful one for uh, newcomers uh, to the SDN world is the Layer 3 SDN distribution, with, which is Atrium, it's called. And the idea there has been to take, say, okay, well, if I want to enter this space, I'm not necessarily going to know all about all of the, the network elements or all the chipsets, what they can provide. I'm not going to necessarily know all of the languages. So Atrium provides a scope where they've tested, they've built a driver um, and this SDN distribution to co connect um, a selection of controllers to switches using different languages. And you can select and set up um, your profile there. And they've tested that against uh, seven SDN switches, and that appeared in the Solutions Showcase, for example. Um, finally, in terms of the OpenFlow developments, um, originally this was um, very IP focused. In the last couple of years, the optical uh, integration has been um, introduced in the proof of concepts and wireless transport also. Um, I've mentioned interoperability repeatedly. Uh, one of the things uh, to try and simplify uh, or to try and understand what devices are interoperable is this concept of table type patterns. Uh, it's also described as negotiable data path models. So the idea there is that a switch and a controller would um, agree or negotiate what they can offer. So as I mentioned, the OpenFlow implementation itself in the hardware might be different, a different number of tables in a multiple table pipeline might be supported, uh, different uh, packets may be possible to parse. Uh, so the TTP provides you the option to, for one uh, device to understand what the other device can actually speak. So they, they start from, a, from a, an understandable playing field. Um, 1.3 is the multiple table pipeline um, of OpenFlow, and as I mentioned, that was be, that's been tested on the seven switches in the Atrium uh, distribution. Um, and finally, in terms of evolution, the protocol independent forwarding uh, is worth a mention. Uh, and the idea here is, again, it's around the abstraction, um, providing an ability to integrate these various different layers of devices uh, and services. So what the protocol independent forwarding is going to do is look at specifying an intermediate representation. So below, above it, you'll have data path models, and then you'll have these different languages. You may have P4, you may have um, PIF or something like that. There will actually be compilers for those languages, um, which will then write, write to an intermediate representation. So the part that will be common to all of this will be the intermediate representation, and that's currently being scoped. And then at the lower level, There'll also be compilers for different devices. So you will have a series of different compilers per network element or network element type, uh, and you'll have compilers for the languages, but that should be a subset, uh, and they should all be able to interpret this intermediate representation. Uh, so there's heavy work going on in that direction at the moment in terms of making a more usable SDN uh, infrastructure and architecture. And then just a note regarding OpenFlow that it is actually three different things. It represents the architecture, that forward and control uh, separation. Um, it's also the model of match action, uh, and it's the protocol in order to load the information base. So where all that fits with the regulatory implications? So the first uh, question we were given was related to enabling fixed network access and giving alternative network operators more control. Um, whether it's possible in principle, um, will it be standardized in a way, and will it be offered by vendors? So I wanted to just approach this by looking at a couple of um, illustrations, really. So this is the original um, that we've seen in slightly different form earlier this morning, uh, with the network elements, southbound interface, controller, um, uh, northbound interface, and applications. And that's the, the simplistic kind of view. So in the most recent um, architecture, version 1.1, which is just being um, published uh, at ONF, 
it looks a little bit more like this. So we're talking now about uh, service consumers and, uh, and absorbers. Um, so basically, you're going to have this set of uh, service. Let me see if this works. Yeah, you're going to have a set of service consumers. Um, they're requesting from a, a, a set of controllers. Now, this can be a hierarchy of controllers. It can be an east-west plane of controllers. They may not necessarily all be under the same control, uh, but they're provi provisioning a service uh, uh, back, to, back to this consumer. Um, and at the lower level, you've then got the SDN controller itself has to request uh, resources. And this pool of resources, whether virtual or physical, uh, will be provisioning um, their services back to the SDN controller. And then you've obviously got the data exchange. So this is kind of showing that you've got this grouping. It's not going to be as so as simplistic as we obviously understand of a single controller with one global view of the network. Um, you, can't, you just simply can't do that. It's not, it's not feasible. Um, and it's also going to be have may potentially have access to resources which then may iterate onto lower resources. Uh, and I think that's quite well shown in this figure here where you have uh, the main, you say you've got one main controller here uh, and a series of resources which are being tapped by, by applications or, or administrators, network operators. But you may also have resource being tapped by another controller and being provided using alternative resources and also being provided on then uh, to other applications. So there's a hierarchy Im 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 implicit there and available there. Um, and in a final view of it, um, we show it with the, with the virtual network functions and the NFE. So the NFE manager as an owner of resources, but also as a user of resources. Uh, and one thing, obviously, uh, from my perspective, it's relevant to, to mention is obviously the impact of security here. So this, is, this shows the feasibility uh, of SDN and NFE, the access um, to the different services and the resources that, that are available physically and virtually. Uh, but obviously, there are security mm -hmm. implications and, and many other implications yet to be, yet to be resolved. But things like multi-tenant segmentation and isolation um, the interactions between multiple controllers uh, and controllers across different, between different operators or different providers. Um, these are understood as issues and they are currently being discussed, um, but they're as yet um, unresolved, I would say, in, in the large part. Um, potentially in, within single implementations or single enterprise implementations or data center implementations, there's a knowledge existing there that has provided the ability to, to serve that in terms of isolation, for example, tenant isolation. But going broader, um, it, it, it's not yet uh, fully resolved. Um, so to recap, um, is it possible in principle to give network access to alternative network operators? Yes, there's a concept of virtual network operators um, arising where you don't necessarily own any um, infrastructure or access, but you will be able to tap into um, access that's made available. Um, and that's through the granularity of open flow. And as that extends, that will, it will, will grow. Uh, and then obviously the, the recursive control and services shown in those charts. Uh, will it be standardized in a way that make access possible? It may look a little different in terms of the standardization. As I mentioned there, there's this idea of the, the way software um, APIs are, are, are developed or standardized. There's the, or the, mo the model uh, follows, that there will be defined interfaces and information models. Yes, they're absolutely required in terms of commonality, um, but the idea of having a specific um, one, one single standard may not, uh, may not come to pass. The idea of this software model is that uh, concept of iteration that I mentioned, so using the code and the functionality and the use cases to derive what the actual information model requires to contain in order to support different services. Um, in terms of the uh, offering by vendors which will make forms possible, um, yes, it actually already is um, being <coughs> offered. There, it's done in different ways at the moment, so there are or orchestration solutions out there. Um, there are platforms for VNFs out there, and I'll come to one of those in a minute, and overlay solutions. Um, but currently, it really is around um, vendor SDN, so you're almost at that vertical silo where um, you're providing by um, one a uh, type of network element will serve one type of controller, which will serve one type of application, which, which is not obviously the vision of, of an open <coughs> SDN. This idea of interoperability still, still requires uh, resolution. Um, and as I mentioned, there's some uh, outstanding security questions to be resolved. Um, so in terms of offering other new forms of network access um, and facilitating new services, 
and just show a couple of those. So this was just to give an idea that um, operators, the involvement of operators in open SDN deployments in the past uh, couple of years. So there have been in telecom operators have been involved in all of the um, ONOS and ODL uh, trials and transport layer uh, SDN, etc. Um, it's been made available to uh, SMEs. They've, it's provided simplification and OPEX reduction that's been proven uh, by several SMEs. Um, and yeah, just to note that open means published but not controlled by a single party. Um, but in terms of these, this offering, yes, it's both possible and currently offered. Um, I think you're probably going to hear more from MEF later about the lifecycle service orchestration, uh, but this is one example of using the SDN and NFE resources. So basically the, the lifecycle service orchestration, if I don't make a mistake describing it, is, is a software um, platform to, to automate OSS and BSS services through the use of, of SDN and NFE and providing an end-to-end -end service. So there's absolutely a drive there um, to enable the access to different, different networks across different networks. Um, in the carrier world. Um, and in terms of this final question was related to the offering virtual network functions. And there are several examples of this. One to, to show here is a NTT elastic service infrastructure um, where they're actually, this here is a, is a VNF marketplace uh, where they're encouraging third party uh, VNFs which can be provisioned then, uh, then on the network. Um, will SDN NFE have an impact in the current value chain? Uh, if this case, will it alter it? Um, yes, absolutely. So as I've mentioned several times there, the current traditional uh, model for, for networking is this, this siloed approach or a vertical uh, approach. Um, and you've got the likes of Huawei and Ericsson and um, Cisco Juniper, et cetera, who would effectively be um, monopolies in, in that plane. And they're offering all in one and dedicated services. With SDN and NFE, um, you're looking at more general purpose products, you're splitting it out into these different devices and different services can be patched together like in that atrium uh, distribution you can select from a different layer. Uh, the idea there is that you're going to have, you're going to end up to be different value because you'll have specialists in individual uh, components and technologies um, and you can't compete if you're providing one single dedicated service. I don't believe that you can compete against a specialist at every layer offering the optimum service at every layer. So yes, um, there will be a, a, an impact in the value chain and I would see that as being uh, better services and faster innovation and generally more opportunities, um, particularly for uh, new entrants to the market and, and smaller companies, SMEs, as I mentioned also before, uh, the idea that uh, developing in software is much more accessible. Um, so it uh, provides an opportunity for entrepreneurship uh, and innovation. Um, will have an impact on the relationship between OTT and telco uh, service providers. Uh, again, yes. Um, so, in fact, uh, SDN and NFE should enable the TSPs to become more competitive with OTTs uh, and more like the OTTs. So, if you think of the, the OTTs, they're pretty, I mean, they're behemoths really, like Swift are creating new services, they've got massive software skills and commodity hardware expertise. They're also building their own private telco facilities. Um, so for one example actually I didn't mention in the open source SDN projects was uh, Project Veil, which is about cloud access for enterprises. So um, a lot of enterprise IT will be through the cloud in the future and, and is probably today, um, providing that um, path back to the cloud from the enterprise using the public internet um, is challenging um, and the OTTs are actually provisioning uh, their own POPs points of presence uh, to provide that direct connection so they have control over the whole thing which leaves no space for, for telcos. Um, so in fact if I'm not going to be too radical saying you should really be looking at regulating potentially the OTTs as, uh, as monopolies uh, rather than uh, looking at uh, regulating TSPs. Um, but they involve a, a enable the ability to deploy optimized um, dynamic services. But where we see the TSPs as having a, an advantage here is the uh, diversity, and particularly in, uh, like in the EU, for example, uh, with the individual geographies and cultures, diversity along those lines with societies. That actually, if the TSPs can exploit that and to provide more specific services, um, what Guran and um, Karen Wilhelm also mentioned this morning about the idea, this, this all being about providing to the consumer uh, offering the cons servicing the cons consumer needs. There's great potential there. Um, and perhaps something to look at is the scale in China, for example, with uh, Baidu and uh, Tencent and Alibaba. They're on a grand scale in terms of what they're offering and uh, that may not necessarily be limited to, to China. Other regulatory implications, just to finish. 
um, part, sort of um, flay, sidestep this question a little bit by just saying that um, it is early days. Uh, there's a gradual transition going on. There's a lot of migration um, looking at the approach to transitioning from traditional to SDN and NFV option opportunities. And our view and the view of ONF would be not to regulate too soon, uh, but to enable these standardized and open interfaces um, and provide the, the, the telcos and the TSPs an opportunity to, to uh, progress in this space. And just to finally mention, I came across this, which I thought was quite interesting, that uh, most pressing problems faced by small and medium enterprises in the EU, EU between uh, 2011 and 2014, they've actually been an increase in saying that the regulation is one of the main things that is, a, is an issue for SMEs. Um, and I think that's probably um, self-explanatory. But that would be the view of the ONF um, that allow this innovation to take place before um, putting regulation in place. And it would be believed that the, the competition that's enabled by these competitive services um, should self-regulate to an extent. Thank you very much. Vanda, thanks very much. <clears throat> Are there questions? Um, we still have a couple of minutes um, for questions. One minute. You will get the mic. Yeah, Emmanuel Tricot from Cold. <clears throat> well, um, standardization uh, is about APIs, but uh, what is an API uh, without uh, the uh, underlying uh, uh, expected behavior of the object behind the API? You know, very often it has been uh, built uh, through, uh, I would say, uh, state transition machines uh, and uh, SLAs. Uh, in order to have an expected behavior of uh, the object behind the API. Uh, how is um, uh, your standard bo body, uh, ONF, uh, working in this, uh, in this dimension? I think it's the focus on the information model and the data models, those common information models, which will become standardized, I would say, information models to represent how this should be fulfilled, this API should be fulfilled, so that you can have multiple APIs or protocols um, but the, the, the information model will describe the, the standard approach. Do you extend it to uh, the uh, finite state uh, modeling uh, of the object behind the interface? I'm afraid I'm not an expert in this field, but um, I can raise the question with the, with the group that's looking at it. I would be interested. Yep, no problem. Any other question? <laughs> that's not the case. Um, Let's proceed. Um, then let me introduce to you Stephen Wright, who is the chair of the Etienne FVISG. We've already heard about their work. Um, I think he has, um, he's largely beating Barrick in terms of coordinating many people to agree on one document. We always feel at Barrick um, getting a, a single view of 28 countries is very difficult. But Etsy obviously um, has many more members, many more companies involved, and um, you are sort of <laughs> managing them to agree. So we are, that's, that's another aspect of um, your work that's similar to ours, but I think your work is at the foundation of what we are talking today. So please, the floor is yours. So thank you very much, Cara, and uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, so let me start with a disclaimer about my presentation, just so you have the context right. So uh, the Etsy NFE ISG is a standards body, so we don't normally advise on, on regulatory policy issues. So what I'm giving you is not a, a consensus standard document position, right? It's, it's my summary of where, uh, where the views of our members are and, and pointing back to what we've done in our documents so that you can uh, find the right place going forward. Um, and in terms of the, uh, the sort of context of the work we're doing in, in NFE, um, I think uh, Wilhelm had a, an earlier version of this figure. Uh, so our, our vision for NFE is to have an open ecosystem for NFE that enables rapid service innovation for the network operators and service providers. Um, innovation in end-to-end -end services being based on software-based deployment and operationalization. That's way too many syllables in one word, um, making this stuff work through uh, software deployment of, of virtualized network functions. 
uh, and they should be independently deployed and operated on, on uh, uh, the appropriate infrastructure. So in, in this, this picture, picture was uh, adapted from uh, the operator white paper that Wilhelm mentioned. Um, and it, it's easy to think of the, the, uh, the VNFs being these existing network functions and taking a box and, and creating the software equivalent. It doesn't quite work that way. So when you, when you virtualize it, there's things that are left behind in hardware functions and you don't completely virtualize things but you can get something that's, that's roughly equivalent in capability, or at least in the important dimensions you're interested in. Um, and the, the, the approach of, of running this, uh, these applications on, on standardized software and on standardized hardware, um, you're trying to build in both the sort of programmability from, from SDN in, in terms of uh, the network connectivity, but, but also the sort of automation capabilities you get from, from cloud infrastructures. So in, in some ways, we see the, the marriage of these two technologies as being a, an important piece going forward. Uh, so our structure is, is perhaps less important. The, uh, the vision statement we have is about this open ecosystem, uh, and we are uh, trying to be proactive in, in coordinating with other industry bodies because, as uh, uh, I think you all realize, this is a significant transition, transformation in the industry. It's not something that, that one body is going to do by themselves. Uh, there are lots of domain experts in, in various um, technologies that all will be impacted to a certain extent w with this, this industry transformation. And, and I really do think of it as a, as a business transformation rather than a, a technology issue. So uh, NFE to me is not about um, setting this bit in the protocol or, or, or um, uh, turning the crank on, on, on some particular state machine. It's a change in mindset, a change in business processes and business practices, and that's being driven by this sort of trend towards softwareization across the whole industry. So we have a, a particular framework that we use uh, within <coughs> our particular group. Um, I think uh, Willem had, had a, a, a slightly different version of this, but it's the same basic concept. You have the, the virtualized network functions running over the, uh, the, the common infrastructure. You have a, a management framework to the side. Uh, and just to give a little additional context in terms of uh, layer two services, um, the, uh, the, the NFE infrastructure um, tends to mean different things to different people. Some people tend to think of it as a, as a, uh, a big cloud data center in the center of the network somewhere. Um, but in reality, it could be deployed at a variety of locations in the operator's network. It could be deployed in customer premises. It could be deployed at the edge of the network, it, or it could be the big data center in the core of the network. Uh, but if you think of a network state where that type of infrastructure is the operator's only infrastructure, there's no other stuff beyond it, then all of your layer two services have to go through that infrastructure. So you have to be able to support them in, in this environment. Um, and if you think of NFE from the perspective of, of um, deploying more complicated functions, then that may seem a bit strange, but it's, it's a sort of basic capability that needs to be supported in, in the NFE infrastructure. Um, and the point of the, the figure is, is just to try and uh, illustrate the layer two connectivity challenges within an NFE I node. So if you have a, uh, a number of servers connected together by, by layer two switches, there may be multiple paths to get layer two connectivity even within an NFE I node. So, um, whether you do it as, as a, a virtual switch running in software, whether you do it using um, enhanced NIC capabilities uh, attached to the server, whether you do it in the um, uh, Ethernet switches associated with the NFI node, uh, there's, there's multiple paths for these kind of things to happen. So there's lots of choices and options in there. So let me progress then to the uh, uh, the eye charts trying to answer the questions. <laughs> um, I think, I believe the charts, the, the slides will be made available afterwards. So I, I, uh, I'll, I'll try and point you to the high points and, and you can read the details later. Um, so the first question around, uh, does this uh, enable more control? Um, 
the high level objectives for our specifications revolve around rapid service innovation, improved operational efficiencies, uh, reduced power usage, uh, standardized and open interfaces for network functions, and, and flexibility in assigning things. So uh, we don't directly address layer two services, um, but the rapid service innovation and the operational efficiencies um, really play in as goals here that, that move, move us in that direction. So we're concerned with, with virtualizing a variety of network functions, including layer two functions, uh, and we work with groups like the MEF to try and make that a reality. Um, when we're virtualizing these functions, it's not just the, the IT functions, it's, sorry, not just the network functions, there's also the management functions, the other business IT functions that also need to be virtualized and also need to run in this infrastructure, and that's an important piece of how to get the, uh, the CapEx gains that people look for. You have to have uh, fungible workloads that, that have different, different operational profiles that you can mix and match to get uh, operational efficiency. Um, if I move on, is this possible in principle? Um, there are lots of operational and practical issues within individual operators to, to turn any service live and move from a, a specification or some open source code into uh, a service offering. Um, and, and standards bodies don't, don't deal with that in general. But where you do have improvements in control through, for example, automated deployment that a, that a service provider achieves, then they could potentially be exposed to other operators with reasonably comparable performance. There might be some small differences in the performance offerings based on the additional functionality, like if you have to provide some additional authentication or something to a, to a, a second service provider, then there might be some small uh, issue associated with that. Um, while, again, these NFEI nodes could be deployed in a variety of locations, um, but just Virtualizing a network function by itself doesn't um, doesn't create new infrastructure beyond the places where the NFEI nodes are deployed. So if the problem is getting these services deployed in new places, just virtualizing things doesn't solve it. it it's a uh, virtualizing is is slicing up the pieces you already have. It's not not deploying new pieces in new locations. So. So will they be standardized in a way, including multi-tenant support? Uh, I think it's a little premature to say whether we'll be successful or not here. Um, we have in our GS001 specification um, a couple of use cases or, or fields of application that do talk about uh, multi-tenant service models. Um, and these uh, provide some hints of, of where we might go in the future, um, but we don't have a, a completed a uh, set of specifications behind there. Um, the uh, architectural framework document that we build on uh, does not explicitly identify inter-provider uh, interfaces as, as a reference point either, uh, although there is discussion about um, the security requirements for multi-tenancy at various interfaces. Um, it's not specifically called out as, as here is the, uh, the inter-provider or, or in multi-tenancy interface. Um, I think the, the other piece to bring out about multi-tenancy is the term gets used in uh, a couple of different ways. So there is, uh, I think, multi-tenancy in the sense of multiple different operators, but in a cloud computing environment, you could have multiple tenants or multiple um, applications, multiple virtual machines. So there's, there's some different word meanings here that we might want to pay attention to. There may be some other meanings as well, but that was at least two that I picked out from, from the documentation that we have. Um, I think the, the other um, aspect I would point to was, was something that, that uh, Sarah had mentioned in her presentation as well, is, is uh, the developments of SDN and NFE are, are kind of symptomatic to this um, softwareization of the whole industry, um, and not just our industry, but a lot of other industries as well. And, and in the process, it's not just software, but it's also the open innovation coming from open source communities that becomes important. Um, and so there is a, a tr transitional transformation, not just in what individual companies do, but also what in industry bodies need to do and how they interact. 
so whether it becomes a uh, uh, an open source implementation or open source community that is ends up driving things or a standards community, I think is something that we will uh, uh, all need to pay attention to uh, over the coming years. Uh, and as was mentioned, we, the uh, uh, the E5 document we have, we try to um, look at different ways that SDN could be applied in the context of NFE, and I'm, I'm sure the, the ONF folks have, have looked at things the other way around as well. So, um, so will they be offered by vendors uh, and or open source um, in, in ways that will make um, such forms of network access possible? So again, we th thought it was a little early, it wasn't exactly clear how this was going to work out. Um, so to provide this VNF as a service idea that's in uh, our, our use case document uh, requires at least the commercial availability of VNFs suitable for the service. Um, we've tried to encourage the um, formation of commercial teams to demonstrate proof of concept type activities. And uh, those proof of concept activities have been quite successful in, in encouraging uh, development and demonstration of capabilities. Um, and in some cases, the demonstrations have, have built on commercial products and, and are in fact commercially available, but not all of the demonstrations are at that stage. Um, we are looking at other ways to try and move beyond um, proving a concept and getting closer to interoperability and, and uh, commercial product ac activities. Um, but that's still still ongoing. Um, if I skip on to the next one, will they enable new forms of network access or network service? Um, well, enabling service innovation is one of the objectives of NFE. Um, whether service innovation corresponds to new forms of network access and sharing is perhaps another question. Um, we're not specifically trying to standardized services or, or new types of services, what we're trying to do is make it easier for people to make them. <laughs> so we're trying to be the arms merchant, allowing people to uh, create their new services to go forth and, and do what they need to do. Um, one way to think about NFE is, is, is an effort to uh, create a market for VNFs. So, so in that sense, we're not trying to address the, uh, the network access market uh, as much as we are trying to address the supplier markets that network operators and service providers need so that they have the tools to create new services more rapidly. And so, so largely we're service agnostic, we tend to be a, a generic architecture that, can, that individual services and technologies can then be mapped to. Um, so we are, we are working with groups like the, the, the MEF, for example, to do that mapping so as to see how uh, LSO and uh, uh, virtualized network functions would, would, would map into each other. Um, and that leads to the, the uh, things like the, uh, the information modeling exercise that we had done last week where we had a number of different industry bodies including the MEF, including uh, ONF, uh, ITU, I think there was about 15 different standards bodies talking about uh, the information models and how to connect them together and what kinds of touch points between the different information models make sense. Um, so again, this is not specifically about network sharing, but it's more that um, as, as these different um, worlds collide in this business transformation, you need to find the touch points between them so that you can effectively, um, uh, effectively operate the infrastructure. Um, it's not that, the, uh, that there is only one way to do things, but that there needs to be efficient ways for, for operators to provide their services. So will they provide, facilitate new services, uh, enabling to set up uh, all these, these Ethernet uh, calls? So we're trying to provide a rapid deployment of new services uh, within NFE. And this really is driven by things like the automated ingestion of new types of VNFs, and uh, the development of new types of services, as well as the deployment of new instances of existing services more rapidly. Um, so on-demand connectivity of layer two services between endpoints uh, within the control of the NFI uh, would be a viable use case in scope of, of NFE. Um, and that would be relevant in two ways, both as a, an overall end-to-end -end service, but also as a component of another service. 
so if you were connecting components of a, uh, a virtual EPC, for example, and you wanted an Ethernet connection between them, uh, then you might want the same kind of tools available there. Um, so let me. So will they enable operators to provide VNF as a service? Um, do we expect this to happen? So we have VNF as a service. Um, articulated in, in the uh, GS001 document. There's not a lot of detail in there, um, although it does provide the basic concept. There are, um, and it doesn't go into specific inter-provider variants of that use case. Um, some um, mobile virtual network operator business models already have a similar use case of a virtualized HSS, I understand. Um, we haven't done more, more detailed specifications on that. That may be something we get to in future. Um, but it may also be that it takes time for the NFEI deployments to really reach the critical mass before you could make it commercially viable to do that, uh, that kind of uh, VNF as a service. So, so if I, as an operator, want to um, have a VNF as a service offering with some other operator, then both of us have to have uh, infrastructure deployments in the right places to be able to move services around. So you've got to get to that stage of, of deployment. Um, and I don't think we're there today. I know there are companies who are deploying infrastructure nodes today and, and uh, are, are starting to roll things out. But um, this kind of service implies the availability of, of that infrastructure across multiple operators. I don't think we're quite there yet. Uh, so will it have an impact on the value chain? Um, yeah, yeah um, so I think the, the short answer is yes, and I think for exactly for the reasons that, uh, that Sarah has mentioned. So SDN and NFE tend to uh, ex explode things apart um, from the, uh, um, the products or, or the, 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 the equipment side um, of the operator. What this does is it allows the, the value chain to become much more dynamic and, and much more subject to open innovation in a lot of ways. Um, and the open source communities provide more, a particular uh, value point or, or factor in, in this value chain leading up to the service providers. And that's a, a change from, from where we've been in the past. Um, but I think it's fair to say that the uh, the use of open source in telecom environment is not yet proven to deliver the uh, operational requirements needed to support critical national infrastructures, security, resilience, and so forth. It's not to say they can't get there, but there's probably some um, additional work to be done in that area. Um, I think the, the other piece is that when you have uh, VNFs that could be not just network functions, but also uh, operation support systems, business support systems, other IT functions, then the, um, uh, you actually have multiple value chains crossing over each other here. So that it's not as simple an environment as, um, uh, as, as Goran had mentioned earlier. It's, it's no longer a simple circuit switch network where things are very isolated and siloed by service. Uh, you have infrastructure that's supporting multiple services, not all of which are communication services. Um, and I think it's also fair to point out that SDN and NFE are not inherently restricted to communication service providers. Um, in a lot of ways, this activity reflects the communication service providers adopting technologies that have been already deployed in the enterprise, <laughs> you know, scaled up and tweaked a little bit. but. Um, uh, it's not necessarily so so new a technology. So um, there's a couple of things that flow from that. You're, you're going to get new business models that might eventually impact the uh, the value chain, um, creating new roles or new um, uh, new types of value chains. Um, and I think the uh, whether you talk about partnering or or over the top players or large enterprises, the, 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 uh, who's in scope for the regulation and <laughs> exactly what is being regulated becomes a, um, uh, an interesting question because uh, as 
you're talking about standardized infrastructure um, and, and just applications running on that infrastructure, there's not a lot of difference uh, between the infrastructure of an OTT player, of a service provider, of a large enterprise. It becomes a little harder to, um, to tell them apart. Would it have an impact on the relationship between OTT and, and service providers? Um, I think the answer is yes. I think it affects both people, um, as, as I think Sarah pointed out as well. The, the uh, uh, to a large extent, a lot of the OTT players already have capabilities in this area, um, and this is the uh, the service providers catching up to some extent. Um, and both groups are are looking at these technologies to improve their their flexibility, um, speed to market, lower cost structures, and so forth. Um, and, and our architectural framework doesn't really distinguish whether the beneficiary is going to be uh, an, an incumbent or a new entrant. It's really uh, a transformation in the industry business models, and it's more about who's uh, uh, adapting to that transformation better, more rapidly, et cetera. Et cetera. Uh, do they have other regulatory implications? Um, so this is the, the critical infrastructure piece. Um, you have a lot more software in the infrastructure in this environment. Um, that's not necessarily bad, it's just different. Uh, and so there are uh, some consequences there that need to be thought through. Um, again, you have this, this um, convergence between communication services and IT services. Uh, we've talked about convergence a lot in this industry in the past, and this is <laughs> happening with a vengeance, I guess, in, in this field. Um, so in, NFE enables service providers to deploy these VNFs on NFI nodes um, in, in various locations that could be, again, in the data center, at the edge of the network, in the customer premises, could be mobile. Um, uh, and SDN has this separation of control and data planes. So, um, what what you, you've pulled things pulled things apart in in multiple dimensions here. So, so, uh, so some blurring of market boundaries in between the IT and, and communications industries is is the most likely result out of this. We think. So that was my slides. So thank you. Uh, if there's a couple of questions or. Steve, thanks very much for this uh, very precise answers to, to our questions that have been difficult to answer, obviously, at this stage. <laughs> we are quite aware of this, but somehow we have to get an overview of what's of getting the big trend. So are there questions to Stephen's presentation? I can't be that good, surely. <laughs> uh, one question for our side. Um, you have mentioned that the activities of open source is rather important also within the area of SDN and NFV. And there are some corporations. Are there formal steps within the Etsy how to cooperate with open source projects and how will Etsy select uh, the open source project because there's a very huge number of different open source projects? So um, there are, well, there have been activities within Etsy. Um, to try to understand uh, how um, how a body like Etsy can support open source activities within Etsy, that's one thing. Um, there are have also within within this within the context of um, the NFE ISG, we have uh, some um, consideration ongoing as to how to reference uh, open source. Communities and and their the artifacts or work products that they produce. Um, so we're trying to get some uh, clarity on how best to do that. Um, I think there is the there, there is a um, as as with any industry transformation, there is a a spectrum of opinion. There are people that are uh, much more focused on open source and less on. Uh, paper specifications and some that are, are much more comfortable with paper specifications and, and um, wouldn't touch open source with a large pole. So um, where, where we end up is, is, is 
with people scattered in the middle. So it may be that there are some set of folks that proceed with open source and, and ignore specifications. Um, and there are folks that um, either aren't comfortable in terms of business model, in terms of IPR rules, uh, whatever, with, with dealing with open source and, and prefer to deal exclusively with, with specifications and suppliers to, to manage their, uh, their commercial uh, liabilities that way. Um, so in terms of the um, um, the, the the differences between standards and open source, I think those are the two big things. Is is the um, uh, the IPR rules associated with um, open source communities tend to be um, different to those in standards bodies, and they tend to be a little more in favor of users of the code as opposed to um, owners of IPR. <laughs> um, and the second is around the, uh, uh, the governance arrangements, the, the open source communities um, the, the, there's a spectrum of things that could be under the category of open source. Um, I, the notion of having a community supporting the code base is particularly important to make it viable, I believe. And so those sort of governance arrangements become become important. It's not just putting the code on a, the code on a GitHub repository. There's got to be some ongoing, some mechanism for ongoing maintenance of the code base to make it viable. Uh, thank you. Uh, for a network operator, it may be not very easy to participate in all activities of st standard development organization and especially within all projects of open source. And even it do, does so, then it, will, it has not a single solution, solution which he can uh, deploy in its network. So it may be not a very desirable situation currently, although it's very innovative. Uh, what are the expectations in the future? Will the number of open source projects even increase or will there be at least at some point of the time a consolidation between open source projects, maybe together with activities of SDOs? Um, so to a, uh, to a certain extent, uh, uh, acronyms like SDN and NFE are the uh, the shiny new toy that a lot of uh, different uh, industry bodies would like to play with. Uh, and so there are um, these activities both in, in a number of specification bodies as well as in a number of um, uh, open source communities. Um, the, uh, to, to, to try and draw a correspondence, so I think, uh, I think Sarah had put up a list of the, uh, of the projects within the open source space that were underway at um, ONF, I think it was around 16 or so. Um, if you look at other open source communities, there's a similar list of projects that they would have. I mean, some are longer, some are shorter, depending on the, the size of the community. Um, and the analogy is this is somewhat similar to the number of specifications that in specification bodies are developing. So. So, so in itself, it's not a problem that these groups have left lots of projects. Um, the challenge is how you bring them all together. Um, and so there are um, different types of open source activities. So some are, are focused on the, uh, the code generation, but there is also a notion of an integration project that tries to bring together various pieces. And, and that integration project really is where the um, interoperability testing between the open source components developed by different communities hits and where, 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 they, where they have to interoperate together to produce a, vi a viable result. Uh, so that's, there is a, an open source community called OPNFE that um, was formed by a number of folks that uh, also formed the, the NFE ISG. Um, and that's their role is trying to um, bring those pieces together. Now, how many implementations of a um, particular chunk of software or network functionality uh, is, is um, a long-term viable community is, is, is uh, another question. But um, I, I, you know, there are some cases where there's, there's maybe 10 different um, open source communities forming around a particular topic, but I would imagine over time they will coalesce down to a smaller number that, um, 
that becomes economically viable, maybe two or three. Yeah. Um, perhaps I can ask a final question that comes a bit from this above um, economist perspective. Um, we have been used to these very simplistic pictures with silos of networks and services being vertically integrated, and that's basically where the regulatory framework currently in place, that's what was in the heads of those that have written that framework. Now, for the past 10 years, we've seen the horizontal model with the applications and the transport sphere being separate. And now we are seeing, to me, I'm, I'm trying to sort of find a chunking mechanism for how to, how to see the future in that respect. Also because now there is a new framework that's, or there is a chance to change some things and obviously you want to do it in a, in a forward-looking perspective. We've always been um, between specialization and scale and we've been discussing yesterday during the dinner, you, you have this um, idea of economies of scale and specialization and there's this constant fight or, or ongoing movement with regard to the advantages of being integrated, that's obviously easier for security, etc., and the advantages of, of having small entrants um, that come up with specialized um, applications. Where, if if you, if I ask you for a simplistic sentence on where we are going now with regard to the silo versus the horizontal um, model, where would you? Where would you see the future? Um, let me go back to uh, the earlier figures. So I, I tend to th so I think there are a couple of um, different ways to answer the question. So uh, I, I think interfaces don't disappear, um, but they may be less important than they have been in the past um, because things become much more dynamic. So if, uh, if the whole point of this kind of thing is to enable automation and the rapid service innovation and rapid service deployments, so if you are going from a world where it takes you multiple months to acquire new specialized equipment and get it deployed to a world where you push a button and it's in service um, and where you can write a few lines of code and change the behavior of something, then um, if you need a different interface, you can create one fairly quickly. Um, and so some interfaces may be important and others will evolve over time. So, so the interfaces um, are important to be known and documented, but I think they are, um, which ones stay there over the long term, I think is, is still to be clarified. Um, I think the, the other piece here is that as you go to this environment, I think you really do get a, a horizontal layering um, where there is a, install, instead of a vertical silo where things are optimized, you, you want to move to a, a, a horizontal view where things are optimized. So you may have um, um, a view of the infrastructure associated with a VIM, for instance, and that provides you um, a common view of, across different kinds of resources. Uh, similarly, at, at the VNF layer, there, there is... A, a, a reason why you might want to manage all of your uh, all of your applications, all of your VNFs from a common point, um, and similarly from a higher service layer, you, you have that kind of thing. So I, I think there is a trend towards a um, horizontal layering um, that is happening here, and that cuts across the um, types of of um, infrastructure, the types of VNFs that are coming from different providers. Uh, and I think the uh, the information model approach is probably the best tool we have to try to capture those abstractions. Um, now, how that plays into regulation, I have no idea. <laughs> but, yeah. That's why we're here to discuss at least 
concepts. <laughs> uh, don't worry, uh, it's it's not the regulators are not up for uh, regulating. We are trying to understand uh, or have a forward-looking perspective. I think that's all. One question. Quick question to Wilhelm. I have a corollary to your question of regulatory implication. What about the event if none of, there is no consolidation? There's many approaches. What would a regulator's view be on that? Uh, <laughs> many thanks for this question. As Kara has pointed out, uh, the objective of this workshop is, it was already mentioned in my presentation, that to get the view of the experts in the area of SDN and NFE. And then we have very internally to discuss the situation. And as mentioned in the presentation of the introduction, and Kara also mentioned in here, it's not the goal <laughs> of the regulator to regulate everything, but maybe it's not uh, for all uh, that uh, in available information. The basic uh, background for the regulation at the national level is the regulatory framework at the level of the European Commission. And every several years, this regulatory framework will get updated. And now the European Commission started this process. And in about 2020, we'll have a new regulatory framework, which will, will then have to deal with uh, the situation of 20 2020 and beyond. So it's necessary. If you try to make a, a, a regulation for 2020 and beyond, then you have to think about what will then the networks and services look like in 2020 and beyond. And SDN and NFE has a, a real potential to rather dramatically maybe, maybe change this. So it's necessary to look in what will be the situation in, in, in five years. And for me, if I look at the presentation, then it may be a rather difficult situation because SDN NFE has a huge potential on the one hand, but on the other hand, it's rather still it's all rather still in the, in the in an initial stage, so nobody knows exactly what really will be happen. It's a not so easy situation, but as I mentioned, yes, I hope this answers your question. Okay, I think now we should break up for coffee. Um, because currently we have uh, we are very well in our schedule, and I would like you to come back here by 11 sharp so that we can continue in that way. You may also want to know that there is a video taken of this workshop, and it will be put on the Barrack website so that those people who cannot share our discussions have a chance to um, to learn from them. Um, since we think we have really brought together quite an ex distinguished. Um, distinguished speakers and it's going to be a helpful discussion. So let's break for coffee and get back at 11.